for a little, for a little bit of background, we can spend uh, hours <laughs> on each, each one of these topics, but I'll, I'll briefly uh, touch on, on them. Um, probably on ranches provide a lot of habitat, uh, particularly here in California, not only for birds, for, for other wildlife species as well. But they also provide other ecosystem services like climate mitigation through carbon sequestration. Uh, they're really important for, for water. A lot of our, or most of our surface water here in California throws, flows through privately owned rangelands. They obviously provide food and fiber and provide other services like open space, culture, and, and others as well. So they're very important in terms of what benefits humans get, get from them. Ranchers uh, have very, there's very little incentives for them for, for stewardship. So they're, obviously their focus is, is on, on production values, on you know, putting as many pounds of beef on an animal and, and getting as many calves out of a cow as they can because that's what they, they're getting paid for. Uh, so even though there are a few programs that incentivize their, their stewardship, uh, those are, are not enough for the, you know, for the potential and for the demand that the, the ranchers have for, for engage, in, engaging in, in conservation. Um, ranchers, and this is particularly true in California, um, their land is, is very valuable, but ranching as an economic activity is not very profitable. So the incentive for them is to actually sell their land, uh, cash in and, and forget about the troubles of, of ranching, which is a really a hard activity to do with, with very, very low profits. Next. Next month. Um, interestingly, uh, ranchers are interested, very interested in conservation. This is, is all data from a survey uh, we took in 2009 when I was with Defenders of Wildlife. We asked uh, ranchers in the Central Valley what kind of uh, uh, conservation values or, or ecosystem services they were interested in providing. And, and look at the, at the data. What, what that showed us is that improving wildlife habitat came as number one. So ranchers were very interested uh, in providing um, wildlife habitat and, and you know, getting compensated for it. Other um, ecosystem services or, or conservation values were restoring native plants, increasing carbon storage, improving water quality. But again, these conservation values are ranked high in terms of interest and, and of them uh, improving wildlife habitat came as, as the most important or the one that they, they were mostly interested in in providing. So this program is, is actually trying to capitalize on, on that, that demand and that, and that desire and, and trying to achieve as many, as many conservation objectives as we can. Um, like I said, ranchers are land rich and cash poor. So what happens is that every year in California, we lose about 20,000 acres of rangelands. And when we lose those rangelands, we lose all those ecosystem services that I was talking about, including bird habitat. So uh, this idea of working with ranchers is not new. Audubon started, Audubon was actually one of the pioneers to, to start engaging uh, not only ranchers, but other private landowners, farmers as well. Uh, the uh, landowner stewardship program, I believe started in 1999. Uh, it, was, it was in place by early 2000s. That's where I learned about it. Uh, Bobcat Ranch was purchased in 2007 to be kind of the flagship of that program and still is the one a really, really, important tool in the way Audubon engages with, with private landowners. Other conservation organizations are also working with ranchers. They realize that there is value in, in working with ranchers. It is a, a sound conservation strategy. Uh, organizations like the Nature Conservancy, Point Blue, Environmental Defense Fund, Defenders of Wildlife. Again, this is even though Audubon was a pioneer, uh, others have, have followed suit. Um, as individual organizations or as part of broader coalitions like the Quivira Coalition in, in New Mexico, Sustainable Northwest in the Pacific Northwest, and here the California Rangeland Conservation Coalition who I uh, directed uh, a few years back. So again, this is kind of the, the background for, uh, and I think this Audubon Conservation Ranching Initiative is kind of the natural evolution of, of, of all this, um, again, in this context that, that, that I just gave you. Last. Thanks, Palaya. Um, for me, the, the program's pretty exciting because it's one of the, the first conservation programs 
that has created this market-based in incentive that can reward ranches that protect and enhance grassland bird habitat on rangelands through this certification process and this certification seal. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of background just on like why we're doing this and the current state of affairs with, with birds in North America. Um, about two years ago, Audubon and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology uh, published a, a pretty comprehensive set of data that showed steep and drastic declines in all bird populations uh, over the past 50 years here in North America. And the, the interesting thing to note is that the, the largest focal group or population um, of birds that has declined is, is grassland birds. So grassland birds are, are drastically declining. Um, something interesting to note on this graph um, is we, we see an, actually an increase in, in wetland bird species over the past 50 years. Um, and that's directly associated with the, the, the protections that have been put in place um, for, for wetlands and riparian areas. Um, just in a, in a different graph here, you can see that grassland birds over the past 50 years have decreased by about 53%. That's half of all the grassland birds have disappeared just over the past few decades. So uh, last year, uh, Audubon National published this online tool. It's called Survival by Degrees. And our science team uh, took into account these different major threats posed by temperature increases um, to birds and bird habitat. And those were sea level rise, urbanization, crop expansion, ex extreme spring heat, uh, wildfires in spring drought. And the cool thing about the tool is you can go online and you can look up a, a specific geography or you can take a look at a specific bird species and it shows you those birds current habitat. And then you can click on, on different buttons to show what that, how that habitat is going to shift based on those threats uh, with a 1.5 degree C increase and a 3 degree C increase. So I took a look at what I feel like is the, the most iconic bird of grasslands, the Western Meadowlark. Um, it's not just my favorite because it's the, the state bird of Wyoming, but to me, it's like one of the direct indicators of ecosystem health in grasslands. So we go out to these oak savannas or these grasslands um, just outside of Davis. And when you, when you see Western Meadowlarks, you're like, okay, something, something good is happening here. Like th this is, providing this habitat. On the contrary, you know, you can drive um, up the Cape Valley or over to Clear Lake and, and you can see some areas that are basically devoid of vegetation. And the only time you see a meadowlark is when you get into taller grass. So I, I love meadowlarks for that reason. But based on this, the modeling for survival by degrees, if, if temperature increases um, 1.5 degrees C, it's basically going to extirpate the Western Meadowlark from the Central Valley of California or California as a whole. Um, to me, that's pretty staggering. And I don't think the Meadowlarks are going to be partying over that. Um, I find it random that uh, their Latin name is Sternella neglecta because oftentimes I think we, we neglect some of these areas that um, we, we go out and take a look at and it seems like they don't serve a purpose, but rangelands are really important. So with this, uh, with this increase in temperature and all of these compounded threats, um, about, about half of California's birds uh, are species that are vulnerable. I like to keep this in here. I know, you know, eastern meadowlarks live a long ways away, but as a counterpart to the western, we have some more statistics on them. And when I wrap my head around that, that total bird loss number, around 720 million individual birds that just don't exist anymore, it was about three and four Eastern meadowlarks. And so if I go out to a place and you know, I, I see 10 meadowlarks on a fence line, I think about 50 years ago, there was 40 meadowlarks on that fence line. So populations uh, are, are definitely de decreasing and we know this is a crisis. So on average, populations of the Eastern Meadowlark fell by 3% a year between 1966 and 2015, which <laughs> included a cumulative decline of 89%, uh, which I think is staggering. And it's totally based on the amount of habitat they have. So they, they live in grasslands, they nest in grasslands, 
they forage on the ground and they eat insects and seeds that come from grasslands. So uh, their status is a common bird, but, but they're definitely in steep decline. The major threats to grasslands here in California are, are land conversion, poor management, and invasive species, as we all know, and, and climate change. So this really creates a kind of a conundrum for us and a challenge because uh, the majority of, of rangelands in California are one, either uh, privately managed or privately owned. So how do we affect change in rangeland management for some of these large tracts of land or even public land um, that, that's being grazed? And that sort of creates an opportunity for us at Audubon to be able, with our certification seal, to connect consu consumers to these producers who are doing things that are both ecologically and economically sound from a management perspective. I added this slide in because I think it goes without saying that, that fire is a part of our future. Um, and I really didn't know where to add it. This photo is from Bobcat Ranch last year, and you can kind of see uh, there's a line going down the middle. So, you know, we all know that, uh, I guess most of us probably know that, that grazing can be used as a fire mitigation tool. Um, Bobcat Ranch and that part of Yolo County has one of the highest return fire intervals in the entire state of California. And Dash could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Bobcat has burned uh, six out of the past 10 years. So uh, last year, about 80% of Bobcat burned. Um, this gives us an opportunity to sort of as assess risk um, associated with fires in the state. Um, Dash has done a really great job building relationships with Cal Fire. Um, it also gives us an opportunity um, through the monitoring that we do on our um, to potentially measure carbon flux and carbon change in soils associated with fire. Um, so I, I wanted to bring up fire and, you know, we're going to be organizing um, a group of, of technical um, advisors and, and experts in the field to actually meet us out in Bobcat um, here in a few months uh, to discuss fire and how we can mitigate fire through grazing. So we now know birds, grassland birds are facing a crisis. Um, how can we achieve uh, these significant lasting changes at an actual scale and size to reverse these population declines in, in grassland birds and in, and in birds in general? And that's by connecting management practices for livestock on these rangelands and grasslands to this market demand that we know exists for healthy food and sustainability. One of the key pieces is is just restoring ecological function to some of these ecosystems, uh, whether they've been degraded or whether man maintaining and enhancing ecological fun function. Uh, the majority of grasslands in the United States uh, evolved with grazers. So grasses and these forbs and different herbaceous species evolved to be grazed and to recover from grazing. Um, and the wildlife that utilize those areas evolved with those grazers too. They evolved to use this mosaic of an ecosystem that is periodically grazed. So we know that grasses evolved with grazers and the wildlife that use those areas also evolved with them. So grazing can, can mimic the role, grazing by cattle can mimic the role of bison and herds of, of other undulates and help rebuild soil, do good things for water and, and enhance plant growth. So Audubon created this program with this market-based approach that recognizes and incentivizes this conservation beef by empowering consumers to go out and actually buy a product when they know everything that's going in to produce that product um, and rewards those good practices and leads to this full circle path of, path of a sustainable future. A, uh, Audubon has put a lot of um, time and energy into the, the ACR program. It started in the, the tall grass prairies in Missouri in the Midwest and has sort of move, moved west from there into the, the mid grass prairies and the short grass prairies, the, the sagebrush steppe of the Rocky Mountains, south to the Flint Hills of Kansas, into the Chihuahuan grasslands of, of Texas, um, and then west from there. So the, the program has been here in California for exactly two years tomorrow. Um, so one of the things that ACR does for, for birds and for business is we become, become partners in land management um, with, 
uh, these different operators out there on the ground. So we help develop habitat management plans for them. Um, we, we certify these products as bird friendly. So we actually certify the land so that the, the operator can use the bird friendly seal on their product for market appeal. Um, we connect ranchers with premium brands and premium markets um, to work out those supply chain linkages. And then we also do the, this communications and marketing side where we offer regional and national promotion uh, of the ACR seal and of folks that are doing good things on the ground. So this is a figure of, um, it's not quite updated for California actually, but uh, this gives you kind of a, a, a sense of the, the breadth and scale of the program nationally, uh, where ranches are. Currently there's, there's over 15 states with enrolled ranches, um, over 107 uh, individual ranches with about 2.3 million acres. I think the, uh, the restaurant and retailer number needs to be updated, but these products are available online as well. And so I think that uh, opens the door for, for people to, to be able to support the program too. Our goal is two and a half million by 2022, um, which I think we will, we will probably meet and exceed. Um, we have field staff in I think 12 different states. Uh, Audubon internally provides the co-development of these habitat management plans on a, on a ranch by ranch basis. Um, we cover the cost of the actual certification through a third party auditor, the Food Alliance. Um, we have national staff in communications and marketing, as well as our national science team. And so we, we've invested a lot um, to see this program succeed. Here in California, um, there's currently four current operations here in the state that have made their way through that certification process. We have 14 more enrolled. So there's 17 different ranch properties that are certified in California. It seems kind of weird. There's four operators, 17 properties. Well, when the program came to California, they were basing it off of their model that they had in the Midwest, where uh, a ranch is usually a contiguous property, potentially with leases that are connected to it, and they can develop a habitat management plan for that ranch, for that operator. And the reason that they can do that and grass finish their animals um, a lot of it's based on precipitation and the amount of vegetation that grows there. Here in California, because the, the biodiversity and the precipitation gradients we have between areas, it's really hard for a producer to be able to run an entire grass finished operation on one property because of those seasonal changes. And so I'll, I have one operator that, that operates on four different, or sorry, five different parcels of land in four different counties and three different ecoregions. So we enrolled four operators, but that included 17 different pieces of land. We now have um, over 20 properties enrolled. So currently we're at about 70,000 acres with 600,000 more acres enrolled as part of the certification process. So you can see in the figure on the right, the, the blue dots are, are currently certified places and the red dots are the, the new enrolled locations. Sort of the, the foundation or cornerstone, as I guess you could say, of our program are our program protocols. And so uh, an operator is required to meet all of our protocols in order to receive their certification. And they're broken down um, realistically into to one year, three year, and five-year protocols based on how long it will take them to actually be able to amend or change their operation um, uh, in a strategic way to, to meet the protocols. They're broken down into habitat management, forage and feeding, animal health and welfare, and environmental sustainability. Now, the, the latter three, forage and feeding, health and welfare, and environmental sustainability, are oftentimes covered in, in other beef certifications on the market, whether that's the Global Animal Partnership or AGA or others. But the habitat management piece is really what sets aside or makes Audubon stand above these other certifications is because we have these requirements for habitat on the ground. So as part of that, the rancher will co-develop this habitat management plan with us that really focuses in on these site-specific things on the property that they're managing, whether that's um, riparian protection or 
um, high intensity, short duration grazing regimes, thinking about oak recruitment or other regionally specific uh, conservation or ecosystem service issues. But we'll, we'll target individual bird species and I'll get into that a little later um, for a particular property and look at how management can improve habitat for those species. Um, for forage and feeding, um, animals um, must not be confined. And so we have a, a full list for each one of these, but there's uh, no animal byproducts allowed. Um, they must be grass fed, grass finished, um, and no feedlots are allowed. For animal health and welfare, um, these practices get into confinement um, and just look at humane treatment of animals in, in general, no growth hormones, uh, no antibiotics. Environmental sustainability uh, covers a lot of the things that a USDA organic certification does. So regulates the use of herbicides, pesticides, uh, neonicotinoids, fertilizers, as well as really dives in deep to, to wetland protection and, and waterway protection, um, looks towards um, increasing overall plant diversity, biodiversity, um, as, as well as pollinator habitat. So um, covers quite a bit within the protocols and I won't get into to too many of them in depth tonight, but um, this was just an example of um, looking at special management considerations on a species by species basis. Uh, for each protocol or specifically the habitat management protocols, there are the general protocols that um, are for the program nationwide. And then we've been developing eco-regional protocols that are specific to eco-regions of California so that we can really target these fo focal species and target the habitat they need. Um, another unique thing about out here is that um, the program was designed to enhance habitat for grassland birds and increase grassland bird populations. Well, as most of us know, a lot of areas in California, the grasslands either aren't native grasslands or there's a lot of rangelands that are grazed that don't necessarily capture the essence of, of grassland birds. So there's these oak savanna obligates. There's a lot of riparian obligates, different areas that have water, have wading birds and shorebirds and waterfowl. And so we really analyze each property individually to develop this list of focal bird species that for the most part are used as indicators of ecosystem health and, and cover the suite of all the birds that are out there. Another piece of habitat management plans uh, that is really important to me personally uh, is that this isn't something Audubon is writing for a ranch that's then gonna sit on a shelf and get dust. This is something we really wanna be interactive with ranchers are. Um, I'm excited about it. I'm excited to see them put in these types of infrastructure associated with their goals um, to manage wildfire risk. And so this, this breaks it down into categories and, and is a quick reference guide. So landowners can go back and see how they're doing on their goals and objectives um, so that they meet them um, not just for Audubon, but their, for their certification. So the, the Food Alliance is our third party auditor or verifier for the certification. Um, Audubon doesn't actually certify the land, it's, it's Food Alliance. And so once the habitat management plan has been developed and completed, it's submitted to Food Alliance with an application that includes affidavits that the rancher has to provide them for verification. Then they conduct uh, a desktop audit and then come on site to actually do a field audit. Um, they, ma they make sure that our ranchers are meeting all the re required protocols. And then once they've made their way through that whole process, um, the Food Alliance is the one that administers the certification letter, at which time the rancher can then use Audubon seal on their products or on their fences of their property. Ecological monitoring um, is a piece of our program nationwide that we do. Here in California, um, we've partnered with Point Blue Conservation Science as part of their range monitoring network um, to do the monitoring on our participating ranches. Right now, um, through range monitoring network, we monitor soils, vegetation, and birds. Um, as we expand here in the state, we need to think strategically about 
um, what our objectives are with, with gathering data and how we can make informed decisions about management with those data. The things that we monitor in soils is texture, soil organic C, uh, bulk density, and water infiltration. These kind, these, each of these factors are inherently related to one another and can really tie into uh, land management and grazing management. Um, and I don't wanna to get too in depth on soils. Um, to me, it's fascinating thinking about, you know, if you have uh, higher soil organic carbon, then you have a higher potential for water holding capacity and water infiltration, which makes your bulk density go down. All of that ties into soil texture. We develop soil maps for, for each ranch as a part of the program and really try to think strategically about where people graze based on soil type and time of year, whether it's wet, whether it's dry, um, what the historic climax plant community is so that we can make uh, informed decisions to try to prevent erosion and prevent compaction, um, as well as other things that happen when, when you graze these areas. Vegetation, we look at ground cover, diversity and species comp composition. Um, and then for bird monitoring, uh, we go out and do point counts. Um, so this is just an example of some data from Bobcat Ranch. And I think it's good to look at these things over time. Um, in particular within areas that we've mapped out um, that have had management changes. And so we can see how a certain type of management or a certain grazing regime, a certain time of year might actually uh, affect birds and habitat. We really try to key in and focus in on nesting and nesting habitat that time of year so um, that, we, that we can protect fledglings and, and protect nests from trampling or, or other things. As part of the, the data that we collect from the, uh, from the bird monitoring on every single ranch that's ACR certified, um, our science team calculates a bird friendliness index. So this takes into account the bird data from the ranch, but also plugs in data from adjacent locations, um, as well as different data sources, whether it's eBird or whether it's from the Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory or the CADC system um, here in California. And then it compares, um, basically the, this BFI compares um, bird diversity and abundance on a property to surrounding areas so that we can actually um, try to draw conclusions about land management. This is just an example of how ACR certified ranches um, relate to regional averages. And it's too early to tell here in California, um, but based on data that's come back from some pilot ranches in Missouri, um, a few years after um, the conservation ranching program was implemented and the grazing regimes within the, the habitat management plan were followed, um, these pilot ranches saw an, in, an overall increase um, by 300% bird diversity, six times the number of, of bob whites, five times the number of eastern meadowlarks, and five times the bird density. So um, it has shown positive results in other parts of the country. As part of the rollout of the program, I know I'm moving quick, you guys, sorry. I, we have a lot to cover and I'm excited about all of it. And so I'm sort of stuffing it down your throats, but um, as far as the rollout of the program here in California, Audubon knew that it's a unique place um, and that we need to do things a, a little more strategically here in the state. So um, we performed uh, this habitat prioritization or a landscape prioritization to um, basically get the, the most bang for our buck when it comes to thinking about um, the most critical areas of rangelands within the state that we can implement the program on to show the, the biggest benefit for grassland and, and rangeland bird species. So we took these 13 different factors, physical, biological, and socioeconomic factors, and put them into a, a hierarchy model where you rank one factor on a zero to one important scale with another factor. You go through all of those, and then you can put that into the model, and it pumps out the importance of each of these factors. So knowing that we have geospatial layers for each factor that we gave a ranking based on the hierarchy scale and then overlaid that over uh, the map of California 
to uh, give us these prioritization areas. And the final figure looks like this. And to me, it, it's pretty striking how, you know, the, the Central Valley is red, meaning it's very low in priority because it's already under production agriculture. It doesn't hold that much value. Um, if you kind of look to some of the greener areas, the, the Central Coast here is, is a large green swath. And that's because of um, the rankings of some of these factors. So um, statewide biodiversity, climate refugia or the resilience of habitats to climate change, uh, wildlife connectivity and, and riparian connectivity ranks really high in this model. Um, factors like distance to grass fed market or distance to USDA slaughterhouse uh, had some of the lowest rankings in that model. So that's kind of shown in this final figure. And the, the cool thing about it is it's, it's a tool. It's one more tool in our toolbox that, that we can use. Um, we haven't really implemented this, but as we move forward and expand capacity, uh, we're starting to think strategically about areas in the state that could be really important for uh, IBAs and, and other locations. So our, our next steps for the program here are to um, engage with our local Audubon chapters. Um, you know, we have an amazing group of folks at, at every chapter. And so as we engage and collaborate with them, in particular, when we're working on these ranches in their region, they have a lot of empirical knowledge of things that are going on on the ground, whether that's with habitat or with birds or with landowners. So, so we need to develop uh, sort of a comprehensive monitoring plan throughout the state that's going to be um, a, a real challenge on all of our ranches. And then, and then the outreach piece, just letting you guys know about the program and about how to support the program through consumers purchasing power. And I can talk a little more at the end about the purchasing power piece and about the feel good piece of knowing what goes into the beef you buy at the store. We'd like to cert certify more ranches and link them. So create networks between our ranches because the animals that are sold as part of the certification have to spend the majority of their life on an ACR ranch. The more ranches that are certified, the more options a rancher has in the face of fire and in the face of drought. Um, just this year, uh, several of our participating ranches uh, burned in the, the Dixie fire. And so giving them outlets, you know, that if these animals can't go or they can't find a place for them to go, they can't be sold as a certified ACR product and, and won't receive the, the premium that they're expecting. We'd like to brand our program as well as help brand uh, other brands or other beef brands uh, here in the state, expand where the, the products are available. Um, we just uh, signed up for a, a brand partnership with Panorama Meats and Panorama um, uh, delivers to all of the, the wild oats and whole foods stores. And so um, getting all of their ranches uh, certified is, is pretty important for us so that um, people can buy the product easily and regularly at the grocery. We want to frame this conservation story um, through our marketing and, and communications teams so that we can do more advocacy and outreach. And in doing so, connecting these consumers to certified ranches. A lot of people like the farm to fork idea. They like the idea of supporting their local economies and their local rural economies. Um, and then the, the last piece of these next steps is adaptive management, which I think is one of the most important. So learn from our mistakes, learn from our data, be able to uh, adapt to environmental conditions or uh, economic conditions and move forward from there. So we have this future vision to increase consumer awareness of not just grassland conservation, but about where your food comes from recognize the potential for that these regenerative grazing practices are not just a conservation tool and one tool in the toolbox, but could be part of a climate solution. Ensure that local food systems are expanded and give support to rural and in particular disadvantaged communities and, and hope the grassland birds, pollinators and wildlife can make a comeback. Uh, 
my current position is funded by the Wildlife Conservation Board of California. Uh, so we, we got a very generous grant from them to pilot the program here in California and are now looking um, for more opportunities. And then another partner of ours is, is Point Blue Conservation Science. We have a pretty long list of other partners that we collaborate with. Um, and I haven't included them, but I'm sure you guys are familiar with most of the other organizations. Uh, and with that, I've included um, the names and links to our current certified places where you can buy ACR beef. Um, and I'd like to open it up to questions. Thank you, Matt. Well, so far, folks, if you have some questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Or if they're uh, involved and you'd like to speak it, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself, raise your hand. You can either physically raise your hand or use the uh, raise your hand feature under the uh, reactions at the bottom of your screen. It looks like someone asked, is the program livestock specific? So right now the program is specific to cattle and specific to, and that's because um, any sort of certification or seal or emblem uh, needs to be approved by the USDA. And so, um, so that's where the program stands right now. The interesting thing is though, that um, this certification isn't, it doesn't certify beef. It certifies the land that the beef was grown on. And so, um, that's kind of something interesting to wrap your head around. And if that's the case, um, uh, a producer or a rancher, um, they can graze sheep on their place. They can raise other livestock on their place as long as they're meeting the protocols um, for the certification. Knowing that we've had discussions within our protocols team about expanding the certification to, to other animal products. Um, we have had interest from other companies that, that want to be able to sell bird-friendly leather. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting, but right now the certification is, is just, can only be displayed on beef products, if that makes sense. Okay. There's another question. Can you say a little bit more about how different grazing management practices affect the ability of the soil to sequester carbon? That's a great question. Um, I, I'm happy to dive into that one, or if, if Palio from the Carbon Cycle Institute would like to talk about it more, we could go on, we could go on for hours. Yeah, let me give it a, a shot. Yes, it, it's, a, it's a complex answer. Um, so here's what, one thing we know is the first thing you need to protect uh, carbon is to keep the carbon that you have. And that's how this program that ties the, the ability of our ranchers to stay ranching. So the land doesn't get converted to other land uses that actually emit carbon. So that's the first step, right? To keep, keep the carbon and the, the potential for carbon sequestration that you have, because you have a healthy plant community uh, growing on, on your land. As far as different grazing management practices, um, the literature is not conclusive in terms of identifying a particular grazing management regime that is more beneficial than others. Part of the reason is because that is very site specific. Uh, even within a ranch, you're gonna have uh, pastures that are gonna respond differently to, a, to the same grazing management regime. And, and the reason is because the soils are gonna be different. So what's, what we know is that good management, however you, however it is defined by the rancher and the, hopefully the, uh, the experts working with a, with a rancher, if it results in a healthier plant community, you can assume that that's more, that is gonna sequester more carbon than ha having, for instance, a lot of bare ground. We know that bare ground does not sequester carbon. We know that a healthy <laughs> plant community on top of the soil sequester carbon. So, uh, so we know these things at a very high level, but as far as management, um, again, the, the literature is inconclusive. You can find literature saying that high intensity rotational grazing sequester more carbon. You can find data that shows that actually continuous traditional grazing sequesters the same amount of carbon. You can find literature, um, for instance, native and, and uh, non-native uh, plant species in California 
don't seem to be sequestering different, uh, different amount of carbon. Uh, natives put the carbon uh, deeper in the soil, but not necessarily more of it. So it is a complex um, answer. And again, I, I like to put it in terms of, of uh, rangeland health. So if your grazing management allows for, the, for your rangeland, for your plant community to be healthier, you will be sequestering more carbon. The question is how much, <laughs> right? Um, Matt, if you wanna qualify or any other, uh, even Dash, if you wanna add anything to that? I might just add in here that I, you know, I think you're steering around uh, not identifying a grazing regime, but you also stated two grazing regimes that do affect the ability of an environment um, to sequester carbon. And that is kind of the two ends of the extreme, right? Not grazing at all or grazing way too much. And I think that really goes to the heart of what this program is all about. And you kind of nailed it at the, at the end there too, is that it's all about the, the health of the rangelands in general. And the health of rangeland in general will produce good results for all sorts of different things, you know, including carbon sequestration. That, that's a good point, Dash. And, you know, we, we only have a few years of data, uh, a few years of soil data in the program so far. And I can think of one instance or one rancher that I work with um, that grazes in a particular way where he has got um, a significant amount of native grass species uh, to come back to his pastures, which, which is pretty rare. Um, and, you know, he probably has the highest density of native grasses I've seen anywhere in the state. And he does get a little more precipitation than other areas, um, but he's done it just with grazing. He hasn't seeded, he hasn't done anything. So I don't know exactly how he got those grasses to come back, but based on the soils data um, that we have so far, um, there is uh, an increased amount of deep soil carbon uh, close to those native stands of grass than there is in, in non-native grass stands. Um, one last thing here too, as it relates to fire, and then it looks like there's another really great question. Um, I think another grazing regime that's, you know, um, kind of really broad that does have a, a very immediate and I think poignant for a lot of people on this call um, impact on is um, grazing as it relates to wildfire and especially catastrophic wildfire and the amount of carbon that is released in a catastrophic wildfire as opposed to the amount of carbon that is released um, in a situation where the fire is moving really lightly through a landscape. Um, so like one of the things we're doing at Bobcat Ranch is to reinstitute prescribed burning, which is a, a really kind of light impact burning on a landscape that releases a very low amount of, of carbon. Um, you know, on the other end of the extreme is a landscape that hasn't seen, you know, a grassland that hasn't seen grazing for years and has built up a lot of fuel, stored a lot of carbon, including in the trees and in the woody species especially. Um, and when all that gets wiped out by catastrophic wildfire, um, you know, that releases all that carbon. Um, and that landscape is all the more um, vulnerable to another catastrophic wildfire the following year. Um, that mechanism is called the fire feedback loop. Um, so grazing just in and of itself um, applied to grasslands to some degree, as long as it's not at either end of the extreme, is a management technique in and of itself um, to inhibit the, the massive release of carbon to the atmosphere from a catastrophic wildfire. That was a good response. Thank you. Uh, Looks like Let's Janet see. has a question on, on how drought yeah, okay. is impacting this work. I think, I mean, I think drought's impacting everyone, obviously. And it's, it's definitely in, impacting agricultural producers and ranchers a lot more than other folks. And it's different for every place. Um, I talk to uh, these people working on the ground and for a lot of them, they're in a dire situation. <clears throat> a lot of folks are selling off animals um, and they either A, don't have the forage that's available to, to feed their animals, or they have the forage, but they don't have the water resources and, and infrastructure um, for those animals in place. And so ways that we sort of think about drought as we're working through uh, a habitat management plan or with landowners 
Um, we provide them uh, this drought decision making tool um, where, where they can go through and kind of rethink their operation um, based on drought and based on the severity of drought. Um, on, in other spots, you know, we're looking for um, ways that we can connect landowners to local resource agencies, whether that's that's RCDs or the NRCS um, that may not just have funds available for drought relief, but but have funds available for infrastructure projects or restoration projects um, that that can help them be more sustainable in the future with drought. And so it's it's something that we discuss often. We try to integrate in their habitat management plan, but uh, the one thing we can't change is the amount of precipitation that falls. So um, knowing that um, drought may be the new norm and that uh, it might not be a, a short-term thing, uh, we need to be proactive in how we think about it. Uh, one of the things that, that I think about is how we can connect or link different ranches at different times of the year. Um, based on plant phenology and, and forage growth and, and being able to, to connect people um, with one another that, that need to move animals different times of the year, um, just based on the, the geography of the state. Um, I mean, there's, a, there's quite a few conventional operations here in the state that um, their animals are finished in, in Nebraska. So, you know, our program is nationwide. And if we can, can connect folks in places that don't have drought, um, and have the same breed of animals, I think that can be really beneficial. Great question. One of the, the barriers of, of this program is the access to more grazing land. It's not only a barrier to this particular program, it's a barrier to the, to the ranching industry in general in California. So um, anything we can do to uh, increase the access to more grazing land uh, for instance, there also, there's a lot of public land that is not grazed right now in the state of California, and that from uh, not only economic but for environmental, environmental reasons, it, it should be grazed. And so I'm hoping to, to work on, on, again, giving more access to, um, to ranchers to more, to more grazing land. In a drought situation, that's even more, even more important, even more dire. Good. Um, uh, I want to, can we respond to, I want to respond to Heather's comment on bats, if that's okay. Uh, Heather, thank you for your comment. Perfect. Yeah, um, yes, that is true. Um, as I was saying, uh, privately owned uh, ranches don't only uh, provide a lot of bird habitat, uh, they're important for other wildlife species. Bats, actually, uh, water troughs from, um, from ranches are really important to bats, and, I, and in fact, I have a a video that I can share with you uh, later, uh, taken from Bat Conservation International at an Arizona ranch in which they counted 500 visits, bat visits uh, to a water trough per minute. And so again, this idea of, you know, whether if, if the ranches, uh, ranches are there providing water for their livestock, they're providing water for the wildlife as well. If the ranches are not there, they sell their land. If the infrastructure gets taken down, the wildlife species are, are also suffering. So uh, yeah, again, this connection between having people, having ranchers on the land and having wildlife is, is, is crucial. That's a great point, Poyo. I, me I messaged Heather separately and I thought I messaged the whole group. Uh, I have a rancher that, uh, that really loves bats and wants to integrate uh, bat management into his HMP. Um, and one thing to keep in mind uh, or one thing to note with bats and with drought is that um, in these times of severe drought, a lot of wildlife are utilizing um, these stock tanks and these water resources for, that were intended for livestock a lot more than usual. And one of our program protocols is, is wildlife escape ramps um, in, in all water troughs and stock tanks. And so uh, I saw a very disturbing photo the other day of a lot of animals in a stock tank that no one's ever seen before just because of the drought and so many more animals are, are utilizing those stock tanks. So I know some, sometimes bats will take a swim in those and um, all of our places will have wildlife escape ramps for them. Great. Yeah, I would wonder about that. If uh, other animals were using those uh, troughs and you know, they, oh, this looks like a nice place for a bath and oops, it's too deep, yeah. I'm glad that we have those ramps in there. Great. 
Uh, folks, is there any other questions? Anyone? Dash? Do you have any more questions or Dash, any more comments about our local Bobcat? <laughs> Um, I guess it, if we're kind of nearing the end here, um, it might be a, a little bit of an opportunity to talk about the phonology project, um, or at least just note that, you know, it's another project that um, at Yolo Audubon is doing at Bobcat Ranch um, to monitor some of the bird populations. Um, it's, if you're not involved in it, it's really more aimed at sort of uh, uh, long-term patterns as they relate to climate change, which right now are especially interesting because we're experiencing, uh, you know, so many of the things we predict with climate change, but they're also like really extreme things that um, are hard, make it harder to interpret what some of the results are. But I think we've passed the five year mark. Um, so we're starting to get to a point where we might actually be able to bring some of this to the science team. Um, so thank you to Yolo Audubon Society for continually coming out and doing that survey. Fantastic. Uh, we've got a great group of volunteers who are keeping it going. Uh, Sonia is on the on the, the talk here, and uh, she's been very instrumental in that. And several other members have uh, volunteered, and as well as uh, some grad students and, uh, and other students from UCD. Uh, it's a great way to bring a lot of disciplines together too, on that trip, trip on that program. Okay. All right then, um, I think we are, uh, we've got everyone's questions. I see no new questions. I wanna thank uh, Heather and Janet for their questions and uh, Diane. Um, you folks get an A, you were, you were paying attention. Um, and I found it very interesting that um, so many ranchers are involved. I, I just think that's wonderful that uh, that they're open and objective um, and uh, and to, to doing something that's uh, a little different and uh, you know recognizing that they're in a business and I'm glad Audubon um, has taken that approach um, and uh, it's, I think in the end in the long term it's going to work for uh, the birds and the ranchers. And the other animals that uh, also uh, utilize the habitat. Uh, fantastic. So I want to thank uh, Matt and Pelayo uh, for their time this evening and their, their generous uh, dissemination of information. Um, it's something I've wondered about for, for a while, and I'm glad to, uh, uh, to learn a little bit more about it tonight. Um, next month, uh, we're going to uh, hear about testing the social intelligence hypothesis in wild jays and uh, starring our own uh, scrub jay, Western scrub, California scrub jay. So I hope you folks tune in. That information will be published uh, in the newsletter and uh, in the other usual places, the website and the Facebook page. Um, again, thank you uh, to Matt and Palayo um, and Dash. Uh, I really do appreciate your your uh, your comments, Dash. Uh, so anyway, folks, I thank you for coming. Good night. I could say cheers. I could say happy birding, but I just want to say uh, thank you very much for your support of Yolo Audubon, uh, and I wish you all a good night. Thanks again to our yeah. speakers. Thanks for having us. Hey, thanks for having us. Nice to see everyone. Thank you. My pleasure. All I right, know. folks. Bye-bye.